And welcome everyone. Firstly, thank you for still being here. It's been a long day, but a most exciting day. So uh, thank you for the, all the previous speakers for making the conference such an exciting event. Okay, now just pointing out, if you have a look at the conference program, the, I'm the very last speaker. And so uh, there is a little blurb about me. And then it says, um, uh, this talk may include drama-based elements. So I don't know if you noticed that. I thought it was so funny. It was like a disclaimer. Warning, this talk includes, includes graphic content. So I just would like to start from there to reassure you, everybody, that no, we are not going to do any drama. So you can relax, okay? There is no drama in this, simply because it's not possible in the webinar uh, version of Zoom to do any drama. I can't see anyone. I just, I'm actually talking to myself and I have to make a huge effort to stare at the little camera and imagine that all my colleagues, wonderful colleagues and all the wonderful students are listening because um, I can't see you, which is what Zoom, uh, the usual meeting Zoom would give us. Therefore, it's not possible to do a participatory workshop, uh, I'm afraid, but it's possible to uh, talk about stuff it's possible to reflect and through the chat which is our lifesaver really in terms of being um, engaged in a conversation uh, we i can still feel that you're there but uh, but no drama so relax okay what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna share screen and have a chat to you about this tpac thing and ideally you can see the screen so if you can't see the screen, shout out Mary, otherwise I'll just imagine that, um, you know, in, that you can all see me. Okay, great. So the TPAC framework and digital lemonade squeezing the TPAC framework. Now, firstly, I'd like to start with a story with a bit of a personal story. Now we've, we've had a few stories today and it's fantastic to see stories in, in talks. I think it really helps us to relate. So here's mine. Uh, this is a picture from uh, my Facebook uh, feed and you know how Facebook gives you memories? Okay, so that was a memory of a year ago, 8th of May, as you can see there, 8th of May 2020. That was my workstation when the pandemic hit. I didn't have a desk, so I was using the ironing board and my comment was working from home. Finally, the ironing board gets used for something. So that's my starting point for the talk. You know, last year in May when... Uh, you know, basically life gave us lemons uh, where we were all caught, you know, in a situation that we were mostly unexpected. Uh, and uh, that was me. That was my particular situation. So after a couple of, uh, you know, very frantic weeks, uh, I then realized that life was never going to be the same. And I started to become interested in the conversations online about the pandemic and education. And I was particularly uh, influenced by one talk by Professor Motos that you can see there in the picture. He's a professor emeritus in applied theater at the University of Valencia. And he hosted this, um, this webinar about the future of arts education and you know, the pandemic, a post-pandemic. So, che puede cambiar en la pedagogía artística post-pandemia? What can change in, in arts education after the pandemic? So the talk was in Spanish. If any of you speak Spanish, I've put the link there uh, for you. I'm not, as, you know, Spanish is not my first language, but, but I am fluent because I did a, a, a degree in Spanish in a previous life. So I thought, oh, why not listen to this? And I'm glad I did because Prof Motos kind of really said something that inspired me and triggered this full uh, reflection that I'm going to share with you. So he said, teaching and learning we can see, we can conceive, frame teaching and learning as micro revolutions in our biography. So micro revolutions that influence us and that trigger us to change. So I started to think about my own revolutions and you know how they say that things in life happen every seven years. You know, it's a bit cliche, but you know, let's just go with the cliche. So every seven years you're supposed to, you know, be renewing yourself and all that. Well, I started to think about my own journey, my own teaching and learning journey and micro revolutions. So let me share it with you. So in high school, when I was in high school, I clearly remember the feeling of knowledge equaling the curriculum. 
Like when I graduated from high school in 1998, I felt so cool because I had covered the full curriculum of my five years of Liceo Linguistico. So I knew I, I could tick all the boxes. I really thought that knowledge was the curriculum and I passed my living cert. And so I just felt I, I knew it all. You know, that's what an 18 year old probably, you know, is that feeling of, I got it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cool. Okay, so that was where I felt at the time, you know, then there was a bit of a micro revolution for me because I took off, I left my native Italy and I embarked on, um, on a road trip across the desert in Australia. And through that experience and a series of things that happened then, I started to realize that knowledge is not that curriculum that I had you know, graduated from in my little tiny degree in Milano, but knowledge is boundless. And that's a photo of me during the, the trip. It was um, uh, you know, a, a very long drive. That was uh, pretty much the view for the whole uh, drive there and that's me doing um, some yoga there in the desert. I had shaved my head um, and so you know it was mostly liberating and that was a micro revolution for me. So knowledge, looking at knowledge in a way which is very different from a boxed approach to knowledge. That brought me then to reconsider my life, to stay in Australia, not just for the gap year but to stay on and to engage in a number of creative art forms and then to end up uh, teaching. So I became a teacher and I loved that, you know, I loved that feeling of uh, doing CPDs and, um, you know, following a lesson plan and um, seeing my students uh, transform and be happy. And so I was teaching Italian as a, as a foreign language to different age groups and stuff. And I did that for, uh, for six or seven years, in fact. And then after those seven years, there was another micro revolution for me. That's when I realized that I was feeling chained by the curriculum, by the lesson plans that I had to adhere to. And I didn't like that at all. So I felt it was a constraint. And I put this picture here, um, reference Viv's wonderful keynote this morning, you know, and looking at the elephant and biting, you know, taking the elephant one bite at a time, eating the elephant one bite at a time. So that led me to do, do another micro revolution. And that was, you know, embarking on uh, a post uh, doctoral uh, journey and getting my PhD. Uh, and my PhD was on uh, the construct of artistry and engagement uh, in teacher uh, education in, in language learning through drama. So I was really kind of unpacking that. And that was another revolution. And since then, I, you know, I worked on my practice, practice embodiment through different groups. And I kind of, and then obviously I joined Trinity. That was my view when I first moved to Trinity. I was up in the sixth floor. Uh, it was nice and breezy. I could see the library there, the Book of Kells. So I sort of, you know, perf perfected my practice. And I kind of felt, you know, I got to a stage in 2020 where I felt like I was really in my comfort zone. And every time I really feel like I'm in my comfort zone, I know that I'm about to hit another crisis, another displacement. So that's exactly what happened because, you know, I had perfected the embodiment sort of approach. And obviously to teach in an embodied way, you need to have bodies in a room, right? So let me tell you uh, a story. I just moved into a new house recently and with my husband, we put up a series of shelves. We were so happy about the shelves. Uh, then we started to put the books on them and before we knew it, the shelves collapsed and they all collapsed on the armchair. And it was Luca and I just looking at each other saying, no, what do we do now? Oh my God. And I, I felt like my 2020 was like that. It was like that to begin with because I was teaching all sorts of embodied stuff and I had to do that remotely. And so it felt, I felt displaced. I couldn't read the group because I was online. I couldn't, sorry, some workers have decided to, to hammer, so I may have to close the window. There you go, you know, not having an office, you know, having to deal with situations. We all know that all facilitators have encountered this situation of displacement. So back to the TPEC framework, I've used the TPEC framework to make sense of my displacement and actually to, to channel it into something productive. So in that talk, Pedagogia Artistica e Pandemia, Arts Education and Pandemic, Prof Motus invited us to reflect on our roles as teacher artists in the pandemic. And he did that 
by offering a conceptual framework and quoting the TPEC framework. And he was saying that, yes, we have the TPEC framework, but we have to think of it as teacher artists. So I started to really investigate uh, what this TPEC framework was and how it could help me. First of all, I'm going to share this talk and every, you see the hyperlinks there, so you can go into the TPEC website. It's fairly straightforward. You, you know, see that logo there and it will give you a clear indication about what the TPEC is. But um, we'll do that together. Before we go into the TPEC, I would just like to mention that this work is based on the foundations of a previous work that most of you will be familiar with. But I've, I've spoken to the TPEC foundations, to a number of people, and some uh, good 30% of people are not aware of Schulman. So I think it's worth it to just quickly point it out. So in the 80s, Schulman, Lee Schulman, put forward a very, very influential framework. That's the PCK framework, and that is referred to as pedagogical content knowledge. Basically, what he was saying is that to be a good teacher, you don't just need to know your subject. You don't just need to know how to teach. You also need to know how to teach your subject. Yeah. So he was talking about different forms of knowledge, content knowledge, which is the subject matter. And if you're very strong in your content knowledge, but if you don't have any pedagogical knowledge, you are not going to go very far. Imagine like someone who's just graduated from, I don't know, maths, you know, the, your maths postgrad, and then he's thrown into the primary or secondary classroom and he's not able to make that connection with the students because he's lucky, you know, the pedagogical knowledge. Obviously, in the School of Education, we're very well versed with pedagogical knowledge, but, you know, colleagues from other disciplines would, uh, you know, perhaps uh, take some time to think about what that is, you know, it's happened to me in other talks, you know, so I won't, I won't spend a lot of time on pedagogical knowledge. Uh, pedagogical content knowledge is transforming your subject knowledge for teaching. And that's what the artistry of teaching is about. And I trust that we're all familiar with that. So that's the foundation. We all know, and if you don't, well, you do now uh, the, the pedagogical content knowledge, PCK, but what the TPAC does is takes this and revisits it in terms of technology. So let me give you a quick overview. Now it's the end of a long day. There is no way I can, uh, you know, go in detail and explore each link. But if you do want tomorrow or you know, Monday, maybe when you're fresh, to go into each link, you'll see that I've hyperlinked each link with a paper. So the, the TPAC framework originated in the early 2000s. And basically, it was Mishra and Köhler that put it forward. In, uh, then in 2006, uh, there was a seminal paper that came out. It's a brilliant paper. I do recommend it. It's short and sweet, and it explains the concept really well. In 2007, there was another important paper called Confronted Wicked Problems. And originally, you'll note it was called, the acronym was TPCK. Then in 2008, they changed the name and the paper is called Breaking News, where it's a paper where they sort of put forth a new acronym, TPAC, as opposed to TPCK. It sounds better anyway. I'll tell you more about it. In 2009, in 2009 there was this diagram that they published and that's become really, really influential. You can see it there on the left-hand side. Now, there has been more than 1,200 articles, 315 theses, and 28 books that have used this diagram. And that was before 2020, uh, on the cusp of 2020. So I can imagine now it's skyrocketed. So it's been a concept, it's a concept that has been um, really influential in education and beyond. In 2016, there was the first handbook of TPAC for educators. And then in 19, the diagram got an upgrade or a makeover. That's because they included, see how in the second circle there, I don't know if you can see it very well, there is the outline and then there's a little tiny word outside that's context. So they included context as well. And we'll go through one by one now and I'll tell you, you know, I'll show you the context, uh, context contextual one. And then obviously in 2020, you know, if you follow Mishra's blog, um, there's been a lot of discussion on how TPEC has been influential to support 
all educators that had to quickly migrate to digital platforms. The reason I'm sharing this is because in that moment of displacement last year, where I had to basically start working overnight, start working online, doing embodied participatory experiential work, the TPEC framework really helped me to understand where I needed to focus on in terms of CPD and to uh, channel a, an overall sense of anxiety. You know, we spoke about anxiety before in a number of ways, you know, and, uh, you know, we saw that anxiety um, manifests in different symptoms, you know, and one way, you know, to think about anxiety is that you have a problem that is out of focus and you can't quite figure it out. Whereas the the TPEC framework really helped me to understand where I was and what I needed to do in order to then make the move to, uh, to teaching online in a way which, was, which suited what I do, which is embodied and experiential. So let's take a look at it. So we've three circles there, technological knowledge, content knowledge and pedagogical knowledge. And the idea of this framework is basically that the three work together and good teaching, which is in the middle there, is technological, pedagogical content knowledge, comes from an intersection of all of those points. And sometimes I had a doubt about something related to IT. And so was that something to do with TCK or TPK or TCK? That helped me to understand where my cons who, first of all, I had to consult. Uh, you know, is it something for the IT department or not? Is it something uh, where I could ask my colleagues in, in drama who have worked online for a long time? Or is it something to do with education or is it something else? So I think that if you're scared of something, you know, if you name the monster, it's no longer scary. You know, I remember hearing that when I was about to submit my thesis and it really helped me. And similarly, you know, I think the TPEC framework can help us to, uh, to make sense of things. So how can we then get lemonade out of these lemons? Now, I, I've already discussed pedagogical content knowledge, content knowledge, and um, the third one there that I can't remember. <laughs> content knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, uh, and, and I'll, I'll start now with technology knowledge, because I think that this is the one that we give for granted. So what is technology knowledge? It's not really just notions of computer literacy, but it's recognizing when IT can assist or impede an educational goal. So it's that sort of knowledge. And also it's a, it's a, flat, it's, it's a willingness to continuously update your knowledge because we know technology is always in a state of flux. So what we knew two years ago, it's already out, outdated now. When I joined Trinity in 2015, the first thing I did was enroll in a Blackboard um, sort of a support uh, training program. I had used Blackboard for many years in my previous university, but I thought I'll just brush up and I learned some things. And now they're all obsolete. You know, like now you don't use Collaborate anymore in the same way you use Ultra, you know, and it's, there's been all these upgrades. So you need to be it's the knowledge that you just have to always update. That, that's an important one because some teachers sort of get stuck and then it's hard to bypass that. So it's that technology knowledge is that. It's also understanding how you can get your goals through technology. Technological content knowledge then is underst an understanding of the manner in which specific technologies are best suited for addressing the subject matter and also technology and content, how an understanding of the manner in which technology and content influence and constrain, and constrain each other. For example, if I now want to do a drama with you wonderful audience that I can't see because of <laughs> being uh, in this online uh, situation and being presented through the webinar, uh, Basically, I know that this is not possible, you know, the, the technology in this situation is impeding, is constraining, you know, my, my goal to have a participatory experience. That's because of the webinar setting. So I'm not even going to try that because I understand that it's not the right um, uh, situation and context. 
and and I remember Mary you will you know you probably thought I was a bit pedantic when you were asking me months ago to uh, you know to to do a drama you were saying oh can, can you please do a drama I remember that conversation we had and I said I wrote at one point only a charlatan would agree to do a drama in this situation because it's not enough time delegates are not interested in drama probably they're tired you know they're not going to be committing plus you know the format is wrong so i think this is about technological content knowledge you know in the sense that you have to know your own subject i'm talking about drama but surely everyone can adapt it to their own uh, particular um, expertise technological pedagogical knowledge then is an understanding of how teaching and learning can change when particular technologies are used in particular ways for example, in the drama room just before with Ebru, you know, we did a role play and a few times I interrupted saying, you know, do we go in gallery view or speaker view? Do we spotlight? Do we pin? Because everything, all these tiny choices are going to make an impact on how we respond to the role play. If you do a teacher in role, which means if you as a teacher take on a role, it's much better if all the, the, the audience, if they spotlight you or they pin you in, in Zoom. Um, otherwise, if someone is coughing, <laughs> then the screen goes to the person. But if you want to see the whole group, then it's much better to go gallery view. If you're doing a role play, it's really cool in Zoom that you can quickly change the name. You know, at the bottom, you go participant change name, you put on the name. You can use a virtual screen to actually immerse your learner in the, in the context that the role play is occurring within. Uh, you can use the mute button to say something really important but you've muted yourself and so the participants can't hear you so the tension is increasing so all of these wonderful things i wouldn't have even known uh, before the pandemic because i didn't even know zoom existed and all of these things were things that i learned in terms of pedagogical content knowledge through the actual trial and error really of doing zoom dramas online and i'm sure that each one of you can relate to things like that because they're so specific to what we do. And the initial anxiety that I was feeling, like probably many other participants or uh, colleagues that, have, um, that were basically forced to teach uh, participatory arts online, was that I didn't think it was possible. I was really skeptical about it. And then at one point, it, it, I realized that I needed to get some training. So I did some CPD. Uh, in various uh, locations and various institutions and I realized that it wasn't impossible it was just that I was getting a little bit stuck perhaps so hence the crisis that I spoke about before now if for example I've taken some notes about today you know things about the opening video at the beginning of um, the conference you know that's a particular way to approach even the full having the conference online you know so that's technology knowledge but also how do you structure a conference like that you know everything that goes into it having the welcome video in the beginning so that the speakers could breathe you know and sort of not be on the spotlight because there was a video played and for us it was a bit cool as audience because we could see the video and we had the nice um, storytelling and all that and then sharing the photographs and then, uh, you know, even the, uh, what was it called now? You see the, that wonderful Stella, you did that uh, Mentimeter, you know, that wonderful tool, you know, that quickly gets us to uh, recap the knowledge and then recycle it. And, and we see that the knowledge that uh, something we've learned then becomes, you know, on the screen, you know, we can see that. So those tools, you know, they're all part of our own uh, teachers pack and TPAC as a framework, if you're interested in this, um, can, really help to make sense of where you know if you're thinking oh gosh i was teaching online today and it just didn't work and instead of just thinking ah oh, you know it didn't work because i'm no good or you know so you're inner critic or because that not because of the pandemic or you know because blah 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 where exactly did it break down so i loved your keynote bib if you're still uh, there um, this morning, you know, you said at one point that reflection was the key. And I'm sharing this, you know, reflection. So after we teach, if we use the TPEC framework to see what worked and what didn't work, it can be very, um, very insightful and sort of channel, you know, the reflection into something that uh, can um, become more useful for us and for our students in the, in the future. The final um, bit that I mentioned, you know, how the, there was an addition was contextual knowledge. I think, uh, and they called that XK, so that, you know, the, as an acronym, so that it wouldn't get confused with the CK. So it's the teacher's knowledge of the context. Uh, and uh, 
that is very, very important. For example, in, in um, a current project that I'm working on, uh, teaching online, I'm always saying to, to my participants, please, you know, turn your camera on, it will help everyone to connect. But I know that some of the participants are in direct provision and they don't want to turn their camera on, probably because they have people behind them or they're feeling uncomfortable. And there's no point in me banging on, turn your camera on, turn your camera on, you know, because, um, you know, the contextual knowledge uh, tells me that um, it's okay that they don't turn it on, you know. So that's also part of TPAC. It's a form of knowledge that goes on into teaching. And it's also important through technology because, you know, you could say, oh yeah, you know, if you do a work workshop online, it's very important that everyone's screen is on, you know. Yes, but what about context? What about if someone is uncomfortable about sharing? So all these things are part of the framework. And if you are interested, I'll share the slides later in your own time. Do have a look at the handbooks. Do have a look even just at the at the website, tpec.org. There's so much there, you know, there are all sorts of uh, tips and tricks and uh, teachers' um, insights. And then you've got the scholars, you know, who created the, the framework and they share their point of view. So I, I, for me, it was particularly useful to make the lemonade out of the lemons. Now, just to finish off, so I shared before the story about the, the books, you know, collapsing. Uh, it's funny how, if I think now it's been another year, hasn't it, since, um, you know, the beginning of the pandemic and things have really changed in my house, so to speak. I've, I've really kind of embraced this uh, displacement and I've framed it as digital displacement. So what I mean by that is I've... Um, uh, firstly, I wrote a paper with two colleagues uh, on this uh, issue, digital displacement as a construct, as an issue. And by digital displacement, we mean uh, the feeling of um, uh, as a facilitator, not, you know, teaching online and therefore not being able to read the group in the same way, not being in your studio or, or teaching space, uh, not being able to understand if one of the participants is disengaging because perhaps they've been upset by some of the comments um, and uh, and so on and so forth. I'm sure you can all relate to those. So we've um, we've uh, termed this uh, phenomenon digital displacement, which encompasses a huge variety of um, of feelings and experiences that other uh, facilitators have gone through. And so that was, you know, a, a creative way, sort of, to to sort of. Um, uh, process uh, my own experience and share it with others but then after that we've also put uh, uh, put in a proposal with Springers to actually create an edited book uh, which we're now um, you know finalizing so other colleagues have uh, submitted their abstracts on their experience of digital displacement as art facilitators and you know now there's uh, events and symposiums and all, all sorts of things so what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is if I think about one year ago, I was feeling, you know, quite hopeless. I had to, you know, we had to do the full uh, TCD drama summer school online. And I was thinking, oh my God, you know, how do we do that? Um, it was many hours online and, you know, with, with a little uh, toddler, you know, in at home, you know, with no desk. It just it was just really getting to me. But then I suppose that through the framework, I started to think about where I needed to focus my energy and attention. So someone's drilling now. Oh, they're finished. So next door, uh, doing Saturday afternoon renovations conveniently. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, I think the visuals are self-explanatory. You know, it, it, it wasn't possible to run the drama summer school in the same way, but the way we did it, I thought, was still very valuable. And um, participants had uh, a, an aesthetic experience, and uh, not just participants, also facilitators. We we felt it was. Um, uh, it was a renewal, you know. So if we go back to the micro um, revolutions, you know, I think I think this is a new. It's seven years on from you know my previous you know moment of like milestone with the PhD and all that. I think it is a, a micro revolution in teaching and learning, and all micro revolutions basically start with a, a, a crisis, you know, a displacement, and this is one which uh, has been global, not just personal. And I think that um, the TPEC framework can, is a way that we can make sense of, uh, of our experience in such a way that um, 
can give us some sort of structure. So that's why I think it's very important that we all, you know, uh, are aware of it. And, you know, we don't have to use it, but being aware of it can um, can help. You know, maybe some of our students, or maybe if you're a student, you know, uh, maybe some of your uh, colleagues as teachers uh, may really find it beneficial.